Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Kay. I am the director of state and local programs at the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Uh, joining me today is Pascal Schubach from uh, the co-founder of the Humanitarian Toolbox, the executive director for the Cascadia Region Earthquake Working Group, and has worked on many projects with a lifelong passion for integration of technology into emergency management. This is for our session on virtualizing EOCs, and it will be a conversation back and forth on what we've seen for the current COVID-19 response, how EOCs have been virtualized in the past, and where we are going forward. So Pascal, I'll hand it to you for some introductions. Yeah, thanks very much, Kevin. Appreciate it. Um, always great to talk about technology, and I'm sure some of those who are in the technology field and disaster worlds see my face, they know it's going to be uh, a lot of tech talk. Um, I have been a, an emergency manager for about 20 years now, and I have focused a lot on using and integrating technology into whatever platform or activity we need to do. And I've done build outs of EOCs from drawings to physical construction and what the infrastructure should look like to building uh, local or re uh, regionalized uh, emergency operation systems, including Web EOC, SharePoint, um, Google applications, the Google Workspace, formerly Google Apps, um, all the way to building regional uh, alert and warning tools in reverse 911 or callback capabilities and mobile apps and developments, the mapping. I, I like to play with the technology in order to be able to adapt the technology to help emergency managers know if it's a good product to buy or not or to participate in. And so as my mom, who is a French native, who still speaks with a French accent after 50 years in the US, I'm her person who explains how to use the technology so that she can use it. And that's, uh, I, I always enjoy helping her, but also helping anyone else understand what there is and what can be done. And what a great time to be in this profession in both technology and emergency management, because this last year has pushed the limits um, I feel like it, it was a roller coaster, whichever tallest roller coaster you can find, it was pushing it off that top edge and just going straight down. And I don't think we've even hit the bottom of the curve yet. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. So, you know, you mentioned a lot of different technologies there kind of in your, your background, whether it's uh, Teams or uh, Google or Microsoft product out there. Um, so there's a lot of organizations that had started to roll these out before COVID-19, have used them for different parts of their organization, maybe not to run operations, and then were forced into this mid-incident virtualization. So what are some of those common challenges when people have virtualized their EOCs during either the COVID-19 pandemic or other incidents you've seen in the past? Well, it, it goes to the basics of, you never introduce something new during a disaster. Um, unless it's a disaster that lasts at least a year or more. Um, and part of that challenge is, is a lot of times people assume the technology is just there and it always works um, or they experience always failure. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of depth in technology. And if you've ever think of a, you know, multi-layered cake, triple that or quadruple that because it's all the way from the end user application to the device to the network, to the infrastructure, to the server, to the speed, to the firewalls. There's so many places of potential error, but if you do plan ahead for it, um, it can actually be very successful and very powerful in supporting an incident. So that's always a challenge on the technology side of making sure those are operational. And emergency managers, I think, have all learned the, the process of working from home, getting through a firewall, getting to a VPN, if it's a secure, uh, making sure they have enough bandwidth because most likely a lot of emergency managers probably had kids on their networks at home, all trying to zoom and team into school or play games and do stuff and really identifying what's needed. Um, thankfully, speeds have gone up and you know cell phones are much faster now. But integrating these tools into our operations become challenging because at the same time, does everyone have access to it? Um, I'm sure a lot of people went through the process of recognizing the limitations of Zoom and, and tools. Oh, it's only 100 person on a call or, or 100 people can be on a call or a conference at a time. Or um, If you're using the free account of Zoom, I know a lot of people at the beginning, you only had 40 minutes to talk and Zoom would turn off the conference call. Whereas if you had an account, but 
how fast can everyone create an account? And we all know in public sector, it sometimes takes a while to get to the director's approval, the accounting department, and the person in the accounting department to make the phone call, setting up the accounts. How many accounts do we need? If there's any miscommunications, is it actually tested, working? Does it meet the IT standards of that agency? So there's a lot of steps that you have to go through that during the start of the disaster cause some significant potholes to go through and pain points. Whereas now, I think a lot of us have that ability now to have access to the tools and are being able to adapt to newer tools because IT departments have recognized, as well as departments, that there's some great tools out there that are valuable in what we're doing and how we can operate them. So uh, I, I had a couple of agencies I helped out with at the beginning that were you know, quick to turn around. I had some agencies that were a little slower to turn around and adapting to um, virtualizing the emergency operations center capabilities. And some who are still kind of sitting there kind of observing um, but as the virus progressed or the COVID progressed to more and more challenges, uh, more and more agencies started to having to go virtual. And I wouldn't doubt to say, and I haven't done any studies, but I would probably say 70 to 80% of every agency has been working virtually um, since the, not the beginning, but at least for now, they should be all virtualized or be able to work from home at a certain level. Yeah, so there's there's obviously challenges even spinning up these technologies and the workflows. And so you, you really talked about the licensing, the access. Are you on the full version? Are you on the free version? Are you on the government cloud version that is a pared down because of security concerns? Do you have access to sensitive databases from law enforcement side or HIPAA data? Um, but there's this other side of challenges that sometimes is around personalities and around uh, the mentality that you know you have a physical EOC and you've put money into this EOC and you have a physical space, so you should be in this actual space. So, can you talk about some of the the challenges of just conceptually when you virtualize, how you lose that presence in a facility? where people can put eyes on the emergency management staff knowing that they're working extra hours and they're really trying to take care of the problem versus kind of the cons out there of uh, maybe you spent millions of dollars, maybe you use grant funds, maybe you really lobbied and used political capital to get a physical space and now you're not there at that physical space. Yeah, and it, it's, a, it's a great point to discuss and I'm sure it's going to be a challenge for many agencies. I also think that there's a challenge to it that the virtualization for us this past year for a lot of agencies just doing their daily work might separate even more the challenge of do we really need to go to the EOC and what is trigger what is the level of a trigger of a disaster that or an incident that requires actual in-person EOC operations. So those who are developing new EOCs might be having a little hard time soon on do we really need to be this big because couldn't we virtualize half of it or part of it? And for people who have, or agencies that already have an EOC and going back to it, um, I'm sure many of them are starting to go back. I know our state, the state of Washington has been in person, and but they have a reduced staffing. And so they, they have a hybrid of multiple people at home, but also working in-house because they're trying to keep the person, you know, the, the safety precautions in play but it's also identified opportunities in that capability. Can you incorporate, you know, me being in the state of Washington, you know, there's a whole state on the other side of the mountain range that's a two to five hour drive. That's gonna take a while for them to get to the EOC. Whereas can we set up communications for them to communicate in a major event so we don't have to, but it's a policy. There's a lot of policy decisions in there. And at the same time, it's also a lot of equipment. Um, by all means, I'm not saying EOCs are going to go away or they need to go away, but in the design and the structure of it is could they operate a little differently? Um, one of the models that I've always seen with an EOC is could you have all the critical essential equipments and hardware stuffed in a trailer and then you just go take in, you know, take over the Holiday Inn and you have hotel room, you have rooms to sleep in, you have food, or, you know, maybe the one has a kitchen or not. And all you have to do is truck in and bring in wires to set up a comms unit, or here's a rolling cart with a ton of laptops, just like what they use in schools 
for classrooms. You know, they have the little rolling cart and there's 40 laptops in it and they're charging. Do we need to have the same physical structures or can we set up the bare minimums to always have comms, always have the, those function, functionalities? So do we set up more warm, cold, hot, or warm and cold EOCs versus, you know, a hundred seat hot EOC that's going to, that might change a little bit for some jurisdictions, especially on budgetary concerns and grant funding concerns and things like that. But I know the technology has definitely changed enough that one of my pet projects I would love to do is set up a 20 iPad, 20, 20 unit iPad EOC with a Mac mini or a small little, you know, PC and put an EOC in a box. And with a Starlink satellite now, you can put that in there, have a voice, have VoIP phones. You know, how small could we get this to fit? And can we fit it in one of those small Pelican cases and have a, you know, 20? You know, what's the challenge of how small can we make it? Now, I don't want to make it, you know, in Zoolander where you have the micro mini phone and, you know, and the pet hospital or whatever children's hospital was. But do we really need to make it, you know, 80,000 square feet or not? What, what can we do? And, what can we change with? Yeah, that, that EOC in a box concept, I think, is how a lot of organizations that don't have a hot EOC kind of running, mm -hmm. they're, they're stuck into a closet and then they have to make do with the, the physical space and whether that's eliminating positions, already doing positions remote, uh, paring down their equipment, having laptops instead of desktops. Uh, there's always pros and cons, you know, as I'm sure a lot of emergency managers that are listening to this, have done the design process in the past. Like what's the pro of a desktop computer? Well, it's always plugged in, it's always on the network. I don't have to charge it. And when I turn on the EOC, it's ready to go versus your laptop in a cart. When was the last time somebody went in and inventoried and updated and made sure everything worked? And you always mm -hmm. have that lag time. And I think this event kind of forces people to understand like what you thought were pros before might be cons now and vice versa. So uh, it, it's really kind of, putting things uh, in a different perspective. So in the past, people have looked at a physical EOC and then the EOC in a box or in a car or a go bag or a trailer as almost this alternate site continuity plan piece. Uh, do you think that going forward, this virtual EOC is still just gonna be an afterthought continuity plan? Or do you think a lot of organizations will start looking at the virtual EOC as their primary facility virtually? I I would say it's always going to be a hybrid. I, I think it's important to always have a facility space where you have your comms hard connected and that capability. And um, a couple points to that one is, you know, and I, I, I'll break it down. If you have a Starlink connection, yeah, there's a little latency to it, but more and more now you're getting faster speeds. I mean, with a small satellite dish, you're getting 100 megs up and most likely, or 100 megs down for sure, and about 100 megs up soon. It's only going to get better. That's much better than a sat phone or a Usenet dish. Um, so right there, that's an increased capacity where you can voice over IP traffic, radio traffic and things as an alternative. But at the same time, if you think about what is necessarily in an emergency operations center, one of the bigger ones that I look at is customer support. We're, we need to help support our end users, the citizens. And there's no need for us to have necessarily a full facility built in that's only used for disasters as a call center where, you know, and the pandemic's a little different because yeah, we're not all, there's not burning buildings outside. There's not gasoline leaks. I mean, people have resources. Yeah. So there's some toilet paper shortages here and there at the beginning, but essentially things are still operational post an earthquake, obviously much different because infrastructure could be down, but that's the perfect time to recognize the model, for example, that I see is a lot of airlines use to help reduce their operational cost. Alaska Airlines, others, they all have home-based call takers. So when you call that 800 number for your airline, you're not getting someone in a call center. You're getting someone at home who's working four hours or six hours, a small router, an IP-based phone, and they log in through their phone or a mobile device, whatever there that the company provides. And all the information that those people need to give to the provided to their end users are on websites that could be hosted in traffic. So if you think about that model, do you, you won't necessarily need that many people locally. If there's a disaster here in the Northwest, let's call Florida, let's call Tennessee, let's call um, Chicago and say, hey, can you guys fire up your you know, call centers and help answer phones? 
and I'll have only one or two people here filling out a wiki so that that information can be shared to others. The mapping, you know, go to Google Maps, you can see images kind of, you know, we don't necessarily always need to have everything on the ground locally. We can share our resources much differently now. And I think that's the change that's going to be coming into play. And at the same time, the last part is when you have small agencies where, you know, there's maybe five people, that's still a pretty large emergency management agency. If you have five staff in emergency management, where you get smaller than that, having your finance person in the EOC or having them at home in their home office or at their actual desk in their office building, they have all their resources. They have all the little cheat sheets on the wall, you know, that they know where all the codes are. Here's this, here's that they can operate and do their daily role, which is also their emergency management role in that disaster and support without necessarily having to disrupt everything else. And I think that disruption move to the EOC can harm the forward progression of recovery. And so it provides, a, I believe it really provides a hybrid model that helps support business continuity or government, you know, co-op continuity of operations. And you touched on it, you know, this difference between, and we see it in a lot of facets of emergency management, government versus kind of private sector NGOs, people that are geographically separated. Uh, you may have a utility company that serves multiple counties and they are not going to send a representative to every single county. They might send one to yeah. the state and coordinate from there, but they're kind of used to this uh, virtualized piece of trying to help out multiple jurisdictions that are impacted from a disaster. So I think maybe uh, taking some of the lessons learned from the private sector and incorporating them into this virtualized process would help kind of overcome some of these stumbling blocks. Absolutely. So, and you know, I heard you, you mentioned Wiki. It's my, it's my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> the ability, you know, this it's the next generation of the living document uh, until somebody erases it mid incident and you don't have version control, of course, but um, you know, Wiki leads- to prevent that. Of course, uh, you, you know, the wiki leads to this, you know, challenging piece of, of EOC's uh, specific components. What are the most challenging uh, to incorporate based on how you normally do business? So I'm just going to throw out a couple questions to you based on your experience. And hopefully people that are watching this recording have something to add uh, as part of the session of what they found to be some of the most challenging pieces to, uh, to virtualize. So it's a wiki. And as a wiki, that's kind of a new technology for some people. So is it a policy challenge? Is it a training challenge? Is it a uh, ingrained in the institution the way things are? Is it a uh, multi-generational workforce? Is it all those things combined that are most challenging? Or what? what's the most challenging piece to virtualize here? Oh, that's a, I think, a dynamic question there. Um, policy is very hard because you have to change policy. People have to read policy. People have to agree to policy and, and then adopt it. Um, and then there's always people who are against that policy process. Um, they see it as too complex or it's not the way that used to be done. Um, I think there's a, a notion that I, tradition is always, to me, a, a negative thing in the sense that, oh, it's because it's always been done this way is a challenging um change to make because it's, oh, it's tradition. It's like, no, it, that's not, it, we need to be efficient and we need to make sure things work. So if it's tradition doesn't work that way anymore, it's time to change. I, I think also there is a little bit of challenge in there to end user understanding um, and ability to, to use and adapt. Um, you know, yes, there are some in the, in the profession who some technology is very frightful for them. It's very, but I think that's also changing over time as, Technology has, you know, ingrained itself more and more into our daily lives. Um, I find it always interesting sometimes people saying, oh, I can't use that at work, but yet you find them using Siri or Alexa at home and you're like, wait, you can do that at home, but you can't do this at work. It, what's that transition? But getting everyone to adjust is a challenge because some people like that stability and some people have a hard time with change, especially in a crisis. So I look at the opportunity of using the technology, obviously, before a disaster happens and testing it, and also being able to provide and receive good positive or negative feedback. But it's challenging when you have limited exercises time, you have a limited training time, so you have to find ways of changing it. And I think this year has 
drastically improve that capability because Teams was forced upon everyone or Zoom was enforced upon everyone chatting. The use of text messaging has just, I, I don't want to see the numbers. Um, how many more people text message me for things because that's just a quick and easy form of communication. But I do see, you know, the wiki coming back and being a great tool um, compared to like collaborative documents. I love Google Docs because of that. You can make comments. Microsoft is fast, fastly approaching that again and coming to help do that capability in 365. Um, but that ability to be able to help reduce email traffic and just go, let's just all work on the same document. If you can experience it, you can see it and you can kind of understand how it works, but you see its value is an instant ability to help make it be better used in any disaster because it's like, oh, I don't have to go hunt for things. I don't have to check my emails as much. I'm not getting as many dings of emails. Okay, I this this actually looks really good. And so that smoothing the edge is a little challenging of change. But um, to your original question, I think policy is the biggest one to, to change and adapting because it involves IT. It's, hey, IT, can you turn the switch on so we can use this tool? And you actually approached on something that's really important to know is there is a difference between 365 normal and 365 government cloud. And some people don't realize those differences and those capabilities like sharing a document and both commenting on a document and opening it up to the public or having it always have to be constantly under a permission key. Um, those things also hamper that, which are all policy-based decisions. Yeah, you learn the hard way about uh, government-wide or agency-wide options on some of these uh, softwares when you're running an agency administrator meeting and the standard set is play a tone when someone joins the meeting and leaves the meeting and you have hundreds of people joining and leaving throughout and you can't really get through your content. When you ask for them to change it, well, one other person in a different department wants that feature. And so that's always a struggle uh, from that <laughs> IT policy perspective. Um, yeah. So, so challenging question. Let's just do the easy button. What's the easiest piece of an EOC that you found to virtualize? The food menu. Because um, it kind of goes away. Um, now, I, I think some of the easier things is if you have a platform you've already on and is starting the process, just doing it, setting up a SharePoint that's shareable between a user group or a Google site, start putting things on there. And if you have a couple people doing it themselves, um, I use a, a Google document for a log and I can make comments to it and add things to it. And then I go grab it later. It tells me the time, the date stamp of when I added those things. So I can then fill out the paperwork later with all the details. Um, I also, I think mapping is a really good way of starting that process and ArcGIS and Esri have done a great job of adapting that a little bit more. And I, I hope ArcGIS and, and Esri don't go into the direction of all of a sudden having a Word document capability and you know they start creating their own office suite. Um, but having them both, having them be able to integrate into both the Google platform and the uh, Microsoft platform is great and connecting that capability. And that's a really good starting point of virtualizing an EOC is, oh, here's access to information that can help you do your job. Um, and the last part that I really find, if you have time to do it, and this is something I started trying to work on way back in 2009 when I was at King County is and when the iPhone came out, I might have been one of those who waited outside for an iPhone. I will not confirm or deny that, but is the power of what's in front of you and working on your daily operations. So virtualizing your emergency operations manual, virtualizing your emergency response plan or your duty officer book so that if you rotate it with people, you just have everyone access inside a site. So there's only one change being made. It can be logged and it automatically updates on everyone's devices as an offline file. You then now increase the capacity of everyone, even when they're off duty to become on duty but they don't have to carry the three and a half, four inch, ring, you know, three ring binder that if it falls, it bursts. Um, starting that off in advance will help increase the process later and making other more complex things easier for them to to adjust and go virtual. And I, I just love that you touch on kind of that activity log piece. If somebody has worse handwriting than doctors and lawyers out there, it's probably emergency managers in the middle of an incident trying to scribble down a note. 
And it's nice that it's not a, a sticky note that you can't read when the operational period turns over. If you're running that in a document that people are typing in and it's tracking who's writing that when they're logged in and there's metadata associated with it, I got to tell you the, the documentation staff love it. Um, yeah. The ability to kind of look back, especially anybody who's dealt with uh, declared disasters before and the breadth of documentation you have to keep for so many years uh, for auditing mm -hmm. purposes, it's so much easier that it's not a, a stack of papers at the end of every day that has to get scanned in. Um, yeah, so two more quick things about that that are really key that are, are strong tools is um, using your mobile phone and texting yourself verbally. So before text, voice to text got better as, as good as it is now, I used to use my Google voice number and I would call myself and leave myself a message and it would transcribe it into text and send me an email. So then I could just then copy and clean up. But one of the things that also that I help participate and help create and have used many times is that virtual operations support team model, which I kind of talked about, about remote call takers. <clears throat> but it's that ability to be able to, hey, if I have a friend and a colleague who's an emergency manager, say, in South Carolina, and I'm here in Washington, they can get online on the call. They can identify themselves, too. But as I'm typing or they could be helping type and take notes and dictating that into the call. Um, Zoom now, actually Google announced this morning or yesterday that it's 100% um, translation capability for transcribing on Chrome browser windows. So if you're using Meet, it'll instantly, within a millisecond or less, have that transcribed. So you can actually get a record of the document and someone can then go clean it up and we can get those notes taken care of faster or just have a baseline. That's a big capability that we didn't have in the past. And that's something that virtualization just and remote capabilities is a huge game saver because you don't want to have to go digging through, you know, handwritten stuff two years, three years later to try and figure something out. You can just do a control F and find something and then, you know, share that document or have access to it. So that's another cool opportunity coming or it's already here, just getting better. Yeah, the, the ability to kind of bolster your EOC staff uh, outside of your kind of sphere of influence, you know, we always provide mutual aid in, in any, you know, public safety emergency management uh, organization, but it, it's typically, you know, neighbors helping neighbors, EOC staff that you've worked with or on regional working groups or committees with. Uh, GIS, you know, this, this is kind of a geospatial event that we're talking about here. Um, always are, are running things like GeoNet and the ability to help mm -hmm. with Python scripts and maps and, and common issues across the world. Uh, I think emergency management's a little behind in being able to incorporate some of those staffing folks, like you mentioned, across the other side of the country that may not be impacted by the hurricane or the wildfires or the storm at that time. Um, and so that this virtual virtualization piece, you know, you talk about both teams, um, really does give that opportunity where you're not digging deep in your own organization for someone who's just yeah. bored and needs to, you know, fill some time. You're getting true professionals that are skilled and trained in those positions to just help with additional operational periods and tasks that need done. Absolutely. And that, that capability, I mean, if you have a GIS expert on the other side of the world who's willing to help, it's, it's just your communication style and capability is what will make it successful or not because you can describe what you really need. And, you know, with Zoom and Teams now with annotation, I, I love my iPad Pro with a pencil on a Zoom call because I can just take my pencil and draw exactly what I'm looking for and say, hey, I need to move this boundary line or can you tell me about this pin, you know, this geo point reference, make the map look like this. And then you hand it off and a couple hours later, it's there and in an email with a link and you're set to go or they can update a website. Um, we don't need necessarily the, the tools now don't necessarily need physical on-site connectivity. You know, it's no longer POTS lines. Um, it's no longer fax machines and hard paper. You can use um, DocuSign from, for PDF signatures to get verification. You know, that's that can be that's global right there. You can use voice over IP. That's global right there. A website is a global access tool. Um, so do you really need to be on site? I would probably say a certain percentage, no. What that percentage is, not really quite sure yet where to balance that out. 
but there'll always be some of those people who believe, yes, you must be on site and you'll see. And for a major event, I could see part of that. But I also look back and go, you're going to be stuck in your EOC and with technology or without technology, you might not know what's going to happen up the road unless you get eyes and ears. So, and those people are going to start getting back to technology faster. Um, I live on an island in Washington, uh, just next to Seattle. And I know when after an earthquake, we're going to have probably limited or no internet connectivity. So as an emergency manager, of course, and a techie geek like I am, I'm getting a Starlink dish because in an earthquake, I will have earthquake, I will have internet connectivity because it's not dependent on the earth right now. So I can communicate with my family. I can share documents. I can start a map and do I have I need and start putting out requests for support. I think those type of things we look at all of a sudden that changes the whole shift of how do we operate. I mean, I still believe in strongly ham radios, the ham radio process. I believe in the radio communications. Those are hardened facilities, hardened connections that I was talking about earlier. You should have it in EOC as a station point. But, you know, at home, I can do quite a bit virtually if I have an internet connection for my local community. So I'm not as necessarily as worried about comms as much anymore now that Starlink or other options are coming out and being useful. Yeah, so, you know, a lot of stuff we've talked about already is here, it's been here in varying levels of maturity. Um, some organizations have adopted virtualized processes, maybe because they have additional staff or they have folks like yourself who actually have a background kind of this technology piece. But is there guidance out there or good local examples and best practices we could kind of point to of people that are virtualized? And we know that there's great guidance from FEMA talking about physical EOC spaces, especially for organizations that are just starting out. Um, where are kind of the gaps out there as far as guidance? Um, it, it's a gap. Um, I think there's a there's been a lot of good work um, in virtual operations support team guidance and models um, and adapting to that. The pandemic has done two things. One, stopped on a lot of other projects other than just dealing with the pandemic. But two, it's also put all those other projects in the high gear in that there's there's a new level of information we need to plan and talk about with technology integration and virtualization. And there's a group, there's a couple different groups working on it. One of the groups is the International Association of Emergency Managers, um, the Emerging Technology Caucus or committee now. And there's a group of us on there that are are talking and working on trying to figure out what those virtu what those virtualization needs are and identifying, I know there's a couple other groups that we're working on some research on the academic side. And I think there's there's that, it's coming around the corner. Um, you know, the pandemic wasn't a, a home run hit in the ballpark for technology, but it did get us the first or second base and maybe the third. But over time, as the recovery process goes, I think that's gonna be the hardest part is going from third base to home. And, um, adapting the technology so it's not a oh we just used it because we had to it's now how do we really make this a part of all the fema standards a part of our operational standards how does it fit into the incident command structure and the planning p to adapting it to the private sector and really making sure that it's officialized but also recognized in its capability I think that's going to happen too. also just the generational change. We have a lot of young emergency managers who grew up on computers, um, hands down. We have a lot of gamers and that technology and experience has is helping us progress forward. Um, and that's going to be a, a change that's coming for sure. And I'm excited for it. Yep. So just wanted to touch on a, a couple points uh, that you had mentioned earlier and then we'll kind of wrap this up. So, um, you know, I think something you said before, virtual doesn't necessarily mean work from home. Uh, I think yeah. when people say that, um, they think, oh, you know, you're not here at work, and so you're going to be at home, and you're not really going to be working. Anybody who's at home with kids, animals, and other stuff happening knows that it's uh, exponentially more difficult to run your, your job at home. But uh, what do you mean by kind of virtual doesn't necessarily mean work from home? And I know you briefly touched on that before. Yeah, so I, I think of, you know, 
bigger cities or even smaller cities, jurisdictions that have smaller building structures on multiple um, in multiple locations, um, you know, school districts, you know, having a school district wide meeting. Well, they could have 10 school buildings. That's 10 different locations. They're all at work. But a, a, a school wide administration meeting means either everyone drives in or you broadcast a meeting to all the 12 buildings or how many buildings there are and people attached to it. Um, so if you think about the ability of, you know, a big jurisdiction or a big government, you know, not everyone's on the same campus. So you could, everyone could be at their offices. They're still at work, but they're not at home, but they're virtualizing the meeting. They're virtualizing that time together to come up with content or discussion. And I look at it as a huge time saver. Now, don't get me wrong. I do enjoy meeting in person with people, but at the same time with so much more meeting to get done, do monthly meetings really need to always be in person or can we do every other or can we do a quarterly meeting together and then save that traffic time? And then the bigger issue that I look at too is the importance of our climate adaption and changing that methodology that we don't need to always be in the room together, especially if you have to travel. Now, if you're all in the same building, sure, everyone walk together to the same building, it's five minutes. But when you have to cross town and it's a 30, 40 minute commute, every month are all those commutes necessary for what we're really doing. I think the pandemic has definitely helped shown that we can do a lot more in a virtual environment, although it is still nice to meet in a face-to-face, which I'm perfectly supportive, but do we really need to do it all the time? And can that really have an impact on our climate adaption and issues that we're having as well? Well, I think that it does. So um, not always having to be virtual meeting at home yeah, although I do like working from home. I, I will admit I enjoy it very much. Uh, it's going to be hard for me personally to reintegrate into that environment of having to go to an office or anything and those challenges, but I think we can adapt and change. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I look at as we go back into or reintegrate back into the work environment. It's never going to be the same again. It's new. And now is an opportune time for us to change that so we can adapt it. The private sector is doing, I think, a pretty good job of doing it. There's some jobs, obviously, you can't do virtually um, until there's a lot of robots, which I'd be more scared about. I don't want a robot garbage um, handler. I would like the real one because there's just too many dynamics to it. But at the same time, for those of us who work in offices and have meetings, I think we can be virtualized, either if that's in our office and we don't have to travel to another office building or you know, a percentage of our time, we can work from home so we can enjoy benefits with family, friends, less travel and things like that. Yeah. So, so obviously a ton of benefits that you had mentioned out there and, you know, kind of to close out, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this are on, you know, year, no longer day, but year and whatever of COVID EOC activation. Mm -hmm. It's just been nonstop Um, nights, weekends, long hours, burnout, and this uh, accessibility to work in the EOC that we've talked about, which a lot of people look at as a benefit. Um, I can just log into my computer and I'm in the EOC and there's not this physical separation where I'm going home and I'm switching off. What can you kind of talk about as we close out going forward uh, that people should be trying to do, whether it's in policy or just personally to ensure that this reintegration once the EOCs go back to normal operational tempos, that there isn't this, you're at home, so you can always be activated and you never get a break. Ab- absolutely. And I, and that's, a, that's always a challenge in the first place before the pandemic is, you know, an emergency manager could bring home their, their radio and they're on call 24 hours a day. So it's a matter of policy, first of all, that um, we, we be respectful and we identify the, the steps that we need to do to make sure we have a work-life balance that ours. Um, emergency managers are notorious for always working more than they probably should um, because of it's what we do and, and it's in our profession. But at the same time, we have the ability to adapt and help use policy to help us reduce that. And part of that is ability to be able to recognize that meetings only happen at a certain amount of times. Um, I've done emergency management in two different sectors in the sense of I've done it for a, a local county here in Seattle and King County, but I've also done it for a university at the University of Washington where I was a global, I had to deal with global issues and the world is constantly moving forward 24 hours a day. So when are the off hours? 
versus the county, well, at night, mostly everything is sleep unless there's an emergency or an activation and you're on the night shift. So the, the work-life balance depends on each type of job you're in. But I think there are measures, and I think the first part is that training between supervisor and employee, recognizing the balance between that, having the ability to pull a trigger and say, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overworked. But I think that ability to work from home helps reduce that a little bit as a benefit, but also using technology to our advantage. Um, phone systems, you know, you can have a phone system in the EOC or in your office that allows you to receive calls only between certain hours. And if not, then it goes to voicemail. If it's an emergency, you have a duty officer call and have stated policies of what that duty officer is used for and needs to be activated or you know called upon very public and trained. It's a matter of training everyone to understand what the boundaries are and what needs to happen. It's also the ability of educating and enforcing policies and developing good policies. And at the same time, it's the end user and being able to go, you know, let's ask three virtual questions in my head. Is this a life-threatening emergency? Is this something that affects my job immediately and needs to be taken care of now? Or can it be taken care of during business hours? And what, what, how much, how much do I want to get involved with this right now in that ability or as my job require, it has a requirement for me to do something about this because it's my job. Um, you know, I think those are important things to have in everyone's user and everyone's mind, but those are growing pains that we can educate and learn on how to adapt, but at the same time, enjoy a little bit of life and some flexibility um, I'll leave you one last thing on this in the separation is I love the new phones, especially the new iPhones. The past, since the iPhone 10, I believe, you have dual SIM capability. So you have a hard SIM card and a soft SIM card, and you can actually have two phone numbers ring to your, your iPhone now and keep things kind of separate. So you can actually know, oh, this is my work calling me, or this is my home calling me, and go, if it's work, I'm not answering it, um, unless they page me and say 911. I think pagers should come back, not the actual hardware, but the mentality of a pager that if you're really needed, I will page you and alert you. And I don't want to say it's text messaging, it's paging, because text messaging, I think, is getting a little too invasive a little bit, um, whereas a pager is like, someone pulled the trigger, they're going to have a good reason to pull the trigger, but it's not something that they can pull the trigger and, and start a conversation with and expect you to answer it. And that's one of the frustrations they have with text messaging right now is someone texts you, they can see that I read it, so they expect an answer. And it's like, no, this is nothing to do. I don't need to answer this right now. Uh, Mom, if you're listening, sorry, I'll, I'll get a hold of you later. But you don't have to worry about that kind of a response. And that's been triggered too much. And that's a break that we need to start figuring out, and especially in reintegration. Um, how do we balance that so people can have their lives back and reduce some of that stress that we have? Well, well, in the spirit of that, knowing that you have to run after this uh, recording to run a vaccination center, um, any closing thoughts for, for everyone on the call? I, I think one of the biggest things is don't be afraid of the technology. Um, don't be afraid of the potential hard work it is to make the technology work, especially if it's public facing for the end users. The goal of our, our the challenge of our profession is sometimes we take the hard and move it along instead we should be the ones that take the hard and make it easy for those next in line so if it's a hard challenge for us to get something created but it's going to make it easy for the end person the citizen or the customer then we should do we should be going through the hard process and sometimes technology is a hard transfer or a hard adaption or adapting to it but if it makes the life easier for the next user or especially a victim or someone who survived a major event, it should be easy for them and hard for us. And don't be afraid of that. It's, it's, it, it can be worked through, it can be adapted and it can be adjusted and it can really over time benefit the profession a lot. Yeah, that, that's a great takeaway. Pascal, it, it was a pleasure talking with you. Um, for anybody who's watching this during our Inspire event, uh, we thank you for, for watching this kind of chat. There is an okay. option for you to submit kind of a survey on the hub page that you're currently visiting of your stories. And that's what we want to hear. We want to hear about your virtualization stories and virtualized planning. Uh, did you do similar things to what Pascal talked about today? 
Did you find a better way, a harder way? Do you wish you would have seen this recording before COVID started so that you knew some of the challenges to come? Um, and so go ahead and, and submit that and, and we'll continue to feature some of those items as we go along uh, for other NAPSIG led events. So um, everyone out there, please be safe and thanks for all the hard work you're doing on this event and all events going forward. And uh, we look forward to, to having you at future uh, Inspire events as we go forward. Thanks. Absolutely, happy to help. Have a great day. Thanks.